Sweet. Happily, most of the things in that song don't apply to me, although I do have a dog and a cat, and they don't fight too much, although when they fight, it's cute. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk, uh, we've sort of talked about last time a fairly traditional file system design, uh, an oldie but goodie, the fast file system. Today we're going to move on and we're going to talk about something quite different. Um, and this is a fun example, log structure file systems are also you know, pretty old and corrupty at this point, but it's a fun example of how uh, a fairly radical idea about on-disk layout was motivated by some changing technology trends. So we'll talk about that. And then if we have time today or uh, at the beginning of class on Friday, um, Friday we're going to talk about RAID. So I'm going to ask you guys to look at a very old research paper from 1980s. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how to approach a research paper since throughout the next month um, of lectures, I'm going to start interweaving some uh, sort of interesting uh, research works with uh, the remaining material in the class. So this is kind of a good starting point. Uh, RAID kind of comes at the end of us talking about file systems and it's an approach to storage that is both useful to know about and, you know, came out, emerged from a research project. So that's something we're going to talk about on Friday. Um, okay, so the midterms are ready for you guys to pick up. Um, they are in my lab, so if you come by during office hours, please ask the TA for help. They will retrieve your midterm for you. If you know your seat number, that would be helpful. Uh, if you don't, we have the mapping there, uh, but they're all organized that way. Um, so again, I posted this on Discourse, but please, if you want to ask a question about your grade or you think that we made a mistake on the exam, that's certainly possible. Uh, we're human beings and we, we do make mistakes. Um, please come to us prepared to make an argument that is stronger than I don't like my grade on this question, right? You know, go through the midterm, go through the rubric, you know, and make an argument based on the rubric saying, okay, I should have gotten two more points on this question because I actually think I answered this part and you didn't see it or whatever. And uh, talk to the TA who actually graded uh, the exam. So I also think we should give uh, Ali a round of applause for grading the exams. Pretty much all he did for the past couple of weeks, um, and he was very careful and very thorough. But again, I mean, we make mistakes, so that happens. Uh, but please, you know, as you go about this process, keep in mind that, you know, the, the goal of giving the exams back and providing all this feedback is to help you guys learn. Um, so, you know, uh, approach it in that in that way. Um, overall, the scores on the exams are fine. I can't remember. I think the median was like a 33 out of 50. Um, I'm happy with that. So this was not the train wreck that we had last year. Um, the overall scores in the class are always, when I assign grades, I do it at the very end, and we look at the overall distribution of scores, and that changes from year to year. So you know, the class is quote unquote curved on some level, whatever that means, uh, but I don't assign letter grades for the midterm. So it just gets factored in with everything else. Okay, any questions about file system stuff, disk stuff, FFS? Anything up to this point on storage? We're almost done with storage. After Friday, we will be done with storage. We're not going to, we're going to move on and talk about other things. Yeah, Steve. Um, last week, you, or last time you uh, mentioned how EXT4 is kind of an implementation of FFS. Where does it start to differ? Like which uh, I shouldn't, yeah, so, I mean, I, I would say that FFS is a template that was followed by a lot of um, what you might call sort of traditional file system designs. That's a great question that I, I, I don't know the answer. I, I don't think that um, EXT4, well, you know, EXT4, for example, gets away from a lot of sort of like, the, I would argue, the really gross rotational planning that FFS had to do. Um, at this point, you know, remember we were talking about those issues where you had to skip over sectors because I couldn't write fast enough. That's all solved. Right? I mean, new buses are fast enough that that's just not an issue anymore, right? Uh, but there are certainly a lot of the feature set of modern file systems. And I would argue the general approach of EXT4 is sort of inherit from, from FFS and other sort of traditional file system designs. Um, in contrast, what we're going to talk about today is very sort of radically different, right? And hopefully you'll see that. That's a good question. Any other questions? All right. So FFS was circa 1982. Uh, LFS came out in 91. So, what's different about 1991 from 1982? Uh, well, let's see, uh, the, the top song in 1991 was Everything I Do, I Do It For You. Does anyone even know these songs? <laughs> Eye of the Tiger? That's a classic, come on. 
Uh, Eye of the Tiger is a better song. So in that sense, you know, 91 was a regression. Um, Gandhi won, won the Oscar for Best Picture in 1982. A Silence of the Lambs. So in that sense, we're, we're, I think we're improving here. Gandhi's not a bad film, but come on. Um, has anyone seen those movies? Anyone ever heard? OK, Silence of the Lambs people have seen. Maybe not Gandhi. Um, all right, so, but what's, uh, so what's different about discs? OK, 10 years have gone by. Um, what do you guys think has happened in disc technology? This was probably when, before you all were born anyway. Um, so disc bandwidth is improving. Um, this is due to you know, improvements in disc technologies, improvements in buses, things like this. So I can get things uh, faster. I can get more data off of the disc, and I can get more data to the disc more quickly. Um, computers have more memory. So this is also significant. So I might have a computer now with 128 megabytes of memory. Ooh, you know, that's fancy schmancy. I think now like an Arduino has more than that. Um, so this is also a big deal. What about seek times? What do you think has happened to seek times? Given our normal understanding of how seek times evolve, seek times followed Moore's law between those times or Anyone want to guess? Slightly better, but not good. Slightly better, but still slow, right? Um, you know, this is a, you know to some degree this is the one part of this problem that we can't solve using better tech, better sort of electronic or computer technology. It's a physical problem. So we got better buses, we got you know thinner tracks, a lot of different other ways that this have improved, but sliding the heads back and forth across the disc is just not getting that much faster. It's not going to. Um, okay. So, so more and more, the problem is seeks themselves. This is increasingly becoming a bottleneck in disk performance. Um, so what can we do to improve this? Well, OK. And, and the problem, of course, here is that the, as bandwidth goes up, the seek impact becomes even worse. Because when I can get to the point on the disk where I want to be and do the reads or writes, I'm doing good. But getting there is still a problem. So, Got a bunch of spare memory lying around. What can I do with that? How is that going to help me here? Now that I've got you know, 128 megabytes of memory, I might have a few megabytes free for what? What can I use that memory for? <coughs> Already talked about this before. How do I use memory to make the disk faster? Yeah. Cache. Use it for a cache, OK? Um, and that cache is going to help me, oh, hello. Um, that, you know, we already covered this. This is sort of review, right? So this is the buffer cache. And that, what is the cache particularly good at? Cache is going to really help me with one particular type of operation, not so much with another. Helps me with reads. Why not so much with writes? What's that? Because the writes actually have to get to disk, right? They have to make it to disk in order to persist. So for the file system to be consistent, at some point, and we talked about the trade-offs involved with how long I wait, I actually have to write the file system data structures to disk. So with great caching, I can potentially avoid a lot of reads. But I can't avoid writes forever. Um, I can coalesce some writes using the cache if I want to be a little bit dangerous about things and wait to move it to disk. But at some point, I have to do that right. Um, OK, so now here was the idea behind LFS. I've got a big cache. I'm going to use that cache to soak up a lot of read traffic. Now let's imagine that I can use the cache to soak up a very, very high percentage of read traffic. The cache is big enough that reads can be somewhat slow, because disk reads are going to be infrequent, because I'm only going to have to read things once, get them into the cache, and then after that I'm good. I still have to do writes. This is the problem. So let's focus on how I can make these writes faster. Now, I can still use the cache to help me here, because like I said before, I can allow the cache to coalesce and combine multiple operations to single blocks and single parts of the disk. And then when I'm ready, write them out all at once so I can try to avoid as many seeks as possible. But I still have to do the writes at some point. OK. So now, you know, try, try to some degree to cleanse your mind of the way that ext4 does block layout and the way that FFS does it. And, and just consider the following question. What's the best way to avoid seeks when I'm writing data to disk? 
Yeah. Yeah, so you know, the only thing about it is write everything in the same place. Now, not exactly the same place, because then I would lose a lot of information, right? But contiguously. So imagine I just write, 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 write in adjacent blocks. Okay, that's the way that I avoid as many seeks as possible because once I've completed writing one block, I'm in the exactly right position to write the next block. Now, if you think about how FFS and ext4 lay things out, this doesn't work because the structures I need to modify are all over the place. The goal of LFS was to come up with a way to avoid as many uh, seeks as possible when writing. Um, so. LFS was, you know, it, this was an idea that sort of emerged as a research prototype by a couple of people out at Stanford. Um, and here's the big idea here, which is that it's a log structured file system. All the writes go to the one place, which is the end of a log. And that log is just something that I append to and append to and append to and append to over and over again as I change different things on disk. You might, that might, raise some red flags, so we'll come back and talk about this. Um, but, and so this sounds great. To some degree, this would make the best use of all this growing disk bandwidth I have because I never have to do seeks. Of course, the problem here is how do I actually accomplish this? Okay, so let's say that I want to, let's talk about more traditional file system designs that don't do this. Let's say I want to change one byte of a file. What are the steps that I need to uh, perform? I'm going to modify one byte of a file. Just in general, what are the types of things I need to do? Yeah. Uh, load the smallest block size you can that contains that byte. Right, so I need to read, I probably need to read the, the block into memory. Okay, make, I can, then at that point I can make the modification in the cache. Okay, now I have a dirty block in the cache. Now what do we need to do? So I've done one seek to read the block. Okay, what's next? Right, so, so I update it, then I, write, I have to write the data block out. What else do I have to do? It's not the only piece of uh, information on the disk that I need to modify, yeah. Yeah, I need to update the inode because the modified timestamp has changed. So I need to, and, and probably actually what I need to do to start, if we go all the way back to the beginning, is actually have to read the inode map because I need to find out where the inode for the file is and where the rest of the data blocks are. So I seek to read the inode. Seek to modify the data blocks, and I have to pick up the data block. So I found the inode map, the inode, the data block. Update the inode. Okay, so what does this look like? So I get the inode map, I get the inode, I write the data block, and I, then I go back and write the inode. And so if you imagine my disk head, and these, in, in a FFS like file system, these are at fixed locations on disk, they don't move. So you know, now if I'm clever, I can try to put these things as close to each other as possible, but there's limits to doing that. All the inodes are in the same spot, or groups of inodes are in fixed locations on disk, meaning that by definition, some of the data blocks will be close to that array of inodes, and some of them will not, you know. Um, okay, so now let's say that I have this big friendly cache, and that's gonna soak up all the reads. So now I can get rid of the seeks to read the inode map, because that's gonna be in the cache. I can get rid of the seek to read the inode because I'm going to assume that's going to be in the cache. Remember, the inodes are in, are in blocks. So, you know, one block of 4K, how, does anyone large, remember how large ext4 inodes were? 128 bytes. So I can get 32 of them into one disk block. So as soon as I read any of the files within this area, I might already have the inode I need because when I brought in one inode, I also brought 31 inodes that happen to be on the same block, right? Um, now I still have to do the modification to the data block. These are the writes, the cache doesn't help me here. Eventually I have to do these and I still have to update the inode. So these are the writes that I can't avoid. Um, so what I've done is I've gotten rid of all the pesky reads but I still have one seek here from the inode to the data block. And again, there's limits to, even if I do very intelligent layout, there's limits to how close I can get these together. So what LFS does is it says, okay, I have this append only log that I've been using throughout the lifetime of the disk. 
when I need to modify something, where do all of the modifications go? Remember, LFS will only write to one location on disk. Where is that location? What's that? It's only one spot on this slide where LFS will perform a write. It's right to the end of the log. So there's two writes I have to do here. What are they? What are they? Inode and the data block. So, okay, so let's imagine I have a current inode and a current data block that are, so these were written before. They're in the log somewhere. These are the current inode and the current data block. When I write a new inode, a new data block, they end up at the end of the log. Now you can already see one of the complications here, which is that as I modify things like the inodes, the inode that was in the log is no longer valid. I've written a newer copy of the inode, and so these are essentially free space. They're, you know, invalid data. They've been superseded by an additional write that I did at the end of the log. But this is the big idea here, which is that by adjusting my data structures, if I can make all of these writes happen in one spot, then I avoid seeking around the disk, right? So this is a nice idea, and this was, there was something I think that was very appealing about log structured file systems, which is one of the reasons they made sort of a big impact when they came out. Yeah? How does this system know that the whole data is now? Yeah, okay, so, well, okay, so we, well, the, the question is, how do I know where the updated inode is? Anyone want to guess? <laughs> it's the most recent. Well, uh, I mean, so one uh, so so one option proposed by Steve is I start at the end of the log and I just look backwards through all the blocks, right, until I find the most recent. That probably is bad. Uh, what's another alternative here? So there's a data structure that I used before, which is a thing that's called the inode map that helps me find the inodes on disk. It contains all the locations of the inodes on disk. What LFS does is it logs that to the log as well. So you can imagine that the front of the log is always this inode map that contains all the locations of the inodes uh, on disk, right? Um, I think I actually just said this, right? So, um, so, we, so we're only going to, you know, the goal here is to try to write as much as possible to this one location. So we write to the disk uh, when blocks are evicted from the buffer cache or when the user calls, calls the sync or fsync. This allows me to defer writes as much as possible. This is something that, that LFS really wants to do, right? It wants to try to combine as much write traffic as possible. Um, so this was the question that was just raised. How do I find the most current version of an inode? LFS maintains an inode map that allows me to look up the location of the inodes in the file system. How did FFS and how did ext4 do this? How, do EXT4, how does ext4 know where an inode is? Remember, I mean, the first step in opening a file is find inode 632, yeah. Yeah, they're in fixed locations on disk. So this is actually, this is the huge difference between these two file systems. If you imagine, you know, to some degree when you format an ext4 file system, it sets up these data structures on disk that are there throughout the life of the file system. The inode 10 is always in the same place. And FFS, stuff's constantly moving around. So the data structures are constantly in flux. Every time I make modifications to a file and, and flush them to disk, things move. And so it's more complicated. The data structures that have to be maintained by FF, LFS are more complicated because things are moving around, right? I can't get away with this idea of just being able to look up things in fixed locations. That doesn't work because every time I make a change, things move. Um, so yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I know, you know, essentially FFS just, LFS just applies this approach to everything. Just log it, put it, put it in the log, um, and, and sort of, uh, as, long, as long as it knows where certain things are in the log, it can find things that it needs. Yeah. Kind of a side note, in the XT4, uh, say you have a disk where there's one block that's corrupt and it's an inode, do you have the same software that's an all the blocks that it's 
Yeah, I mean, if you lose, yeah, so if you lose data, if you lose some file system metadata, you can certainly lose uh, lots of things. Um, what's an easy workaround for that? What, what would I want to do with certain really, really valuable data structures like the super block and inode maps? What's a way to avoid that problem? Yeah. What's that? I could rate it together. Let's say I just have one disk. Yeah. Yeah, put a backup copy somewhere. Right. Remember what, remember what FFS did where every cylinder group had a copy of the super block. So, you know, and a lot of times, remember, this, these metadata structures are small. And so making copies of them to make sure that I don't have this problem is, is a pretty good idea. It doesn't waste a lot of space. And yeah, I mean, if, if you lose a whole block of inodes and suddenly you can't find any of those files, you're going to be sad. Right. Um, yeah. Is there a reason that FFS doesn't utilize like an inode map similar to LFS and then you could add and subtract inodes from either? So, 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 so I, sorry, I want to make sure this is, um, this is, this is not unclear. So FFS and NEXT4 do use an inode map, just the location of the inodes doesn't change. So when you, somewhere at the beginning of an EXT4 file system is a data structure that tells me where all the inodes are in, in, on disk. That just never changes, right? That's important because when you, when you format a disk, you have a certain number of blocks and maybe you're sharing the disk with other things, right? So you still need to record that information. It's just inodes never move. On FFS, I keep saying FFS, LFS, the inodes are constantly hopping around because they're being relogged, and so I have to update that data structure on a regular basis. Okay. Right? But you can imagine it's a similar type of data structure. Um, for FFS, the advantage is I could read that in once, and then it's in a cache, and I just use it over and over again. Right? I don't have to worry about updating it ever. they are good questions. OK. Um, so, so essentially, you know, all the file, same thing with Anything that I can, any part of the file system metadata I need to write, it just all gets put in the log. That includes the inode, uh, the, the data structures that record what inodes are in use and what data blocks are in use. All that stuff is just appended to the log. Um, so here's the problem. Well, here's, here's where things get interesting, okay? You can imagine the first time I format an LFS file system, the log starts on one end of the disk. And then it's just growing, 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 growing. And at some point, it gets to the end of the disk. So what do I have to do at that point? Does, so this, means, this must mean the disk is full, and I just have to, re to report to the user that it's full, and you know, sorry, you need to buy a new dr drive, right? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, so there's, a, it, when, when the log hits the end of the disk, that is not the end of the LFS file system. There is a lot of unused stuff, garbage in the log that I've never cleaned up. Remember those inodes and things that, that were sort of dead in the log before? Those have never been reclaimed. Yeah, Steve. Um, I get the reason for appending stuff at the end of the log file and how it's, that makes it kind of fast, but like, why not just don't want to seek. Oh, right. Seeks are my enemy. Yeah, yeah, remember, whole goal here is cache soaks up reads. So essentially, no or very, very small number of reads and writes all go to the end of the log. So you're trying to reduce seeks as much as possible. It's a great, it's a great question. We'll come back to this. Um, so when I get, when the log gets quote unquote full, what that really means is that I just hit the end and I need to clean the log. Um, so the cleaning process, you can imagine how this works. I start at the end of the log that's active and I use that to identify all of the actual inodes and data blocks in, on the disk that are part of the current file system. Everything else is old copies of things, wasted space, whatever. And so I can go through, I can pick up everything that's alive, and I can compact it together. I can create a new log that has only active entries, and I can restart things again and keep going. Um, so you can think about, I mean, the, the way to think about this conceptually is you can do this over the entire log. In reality, LFS does this over small segments. So when I get to the end of a particular segment, I clean it. Um, here's a sort of a silly animation showing how that works. Imagine that I have, 
you know, these are, maybe these are data blocks and these are inodes. I move all of the active information into, the, the other reason to do this uh, with using segments is because I use a clean, I have a part of the disk that's completely free, and then I have the part that I'm cleaning, and I can move things into the clean part. So I start with, I started with this one segment that's very fragmented, this other one that's clean, I compact everything into the uh, unused segment, and then I can free everything from the other segment and keep going. And I can start to log either down here or up there. What's the, you know, what do you anticipate being a problem? Why is this a problem? What's that? Yeah, okay, so that's fair. Um, if I didn't have segments on the disk, I would really have to stall the entire file system while this is going on. When I get to the end of the log, if I don't use this segment-based approach, I'm stuck. I can't actually make any changes to the file system until this whole cleaning process is finished. But what else about this strikes you as potentially problematic? Yeah. If power is lost during the cleaning. Okay, so that's a good point. I mean, we haven't talked at any. We haven't talked at all about reliability or fault tolerance here. Um, and and during the cleaning, I'm moving a lot of things around. Um, so that could be a problem. What else? Yeah. Well, what about the performance overhead of this operation? You know, I'm, cleaning is incredibly I.O. intensive. I'm, cop I'm going through all of these parts of one part of the disk, and I have to copy all their contents somewhere else maybe, or move them around. So this, is, so this, was, this was sort of like the, this is what created debates over the, uh, the effectiveness of LFS, right? LFS is great when I'm just appending to the end of the log, so that's awesome. And you might imagine if I was running a benchmark on LFS, it would be like great for the first few minutes as it filled up the log. Then, once I get to the point where I actually have to start cleaning stuff, that cleaning overhead starts to become problematic because even if I divide the disk into segments, and I'm cleaning a segment while I'm using another segment, that what does that cleaning produce that I was trying to avoid? Seeks. Seeks, yeah. So, you know, so long to this idea that I'm just happily appending things to one location on disk. Now, in parallel with that, I've got to have the disk head jumping all over the place over here to clean up an, uh, a dirty segment and prepare that space for reuse. Um, so LFS, when you start thinking about LFS on some level, it seems like it's an awesome idea and it's, it's going to, you know, it's the next best thing since sliced bread. And then when you start thinking about the cleaning, you start to worry. Um, and then this is the, the cleaning overhead of LFS. The, the other thing that's really interesting about cleaning is cleaning has a lot to do with how the file system is used. So the rate at which I have to log things, the amount of fragmentation in the segments, things like this. Um, and so LFS had this property which made for great, like a great research prototype which is that it seems like it could work great under certain conditions and then work terrible under other conditions. Um, and so depending on how you measured it, uh, people found different things. Um, so, and, and then you start thinking about, so LFS design spent a lot of time trying to optimize cleaning. So considering things like when do I run the cleaner? Well, probably I want to do this while the system is idle because that way I don't interfere with the ongoing uh, operation of the disk. Um, what size segments should be clean? So here's an interesting trade-off. If I use a large segment, then you know the, the bang, so you think about I'm starting this cleaning operation, the bang for my buck is very high because I get a lot of space back. Um, but small segments have this really attractive property as well, which is that if I choose a small segment size, it's possible that a segment is entirely dead. Imagine that there's a spot in the log that everything in there, whether they were data blocks, inodes, other on disk data structures, has just been updated since it was written. And so there are no active blocks in that part of the disk. And so if I can detect that, I can say, okay, done. Right? The cleaning operation becomes a no-op, essentially. Um, so that's cool. Um, and this was what I was just pointing out. This cleaning overhead is extremely workload dependent. Um, and so this led to these, so when LFS came out, you know, people thought, oh, this is awesome. And then 
uh, unfortunately, other people had time on their hands and decided to run experiments about LFS and found, found some different things. Um, so the, the other problem with LFS is the following. So if, now remember, we were presuming all this time that the cache was going to soak up like all of the reads, almost all of the reads, clearly not all of them. That would, be, that would be a very effective cache, right, if it was magical enough that you actually never had to read things into it at all. Um, probably not something that you can build, but hopefully we read things once. So because of how LFS works, what property, let's say that the cache doesn't work as well as I wanted to, and I actually have to do some reads from time to time, um, what's sort of unfortunate about LFS from that perspective compared to something like AC4 or FFS? And all of this is doing all this work to try to make sure that all the writes go to one spot on the disk, but that's all based on this presumption that I don't have to do any reads. If I do have to do some reads, where are those parts of the disk that I need to read, where are those things going to be? Yeah. We have to go find it, but where could it be on disk? It's going to be earlier in the log file, but that could be like anywhere, basically. So. You know, one way to think about this is the XT4 makes a decision at format time that tries to optimize the average case. Most inodes are close to most data blocks because I've created them in these groups throughout the disk. LFS is trying to optimize for this best case, which is that the cache works really well, and in that case I don't have to do any reads and I can just sit there writing to the end of the log, but if the cache doesn't work, then the block allocation on the rest of the disk is just like all over the place, incredibly discontiguous. Um, same thing when you think about contiguous parts of a file. So remember, ext4 has this idea of an extent. So for larger files, it makes sure that a chunk of the file is all together on disk. LFS didn't really think about that. So the extent that ext4 would find all in a series of contiguous blocks, LFS is like all over the place. So if the cache doesn't work out, this can be a problem. Um, so this, you know, there's some sort of, I don't know, this led to kind of an interesting debate. Um, so in 91, the original LFS paper comes out to grade a claim, you know, this is an awesome idea. Um, in 93, there was, um, you know, Margot Seltzer, whose name you guys might recognize as the creator of the torture chamber that is OS-161 that you guys are using. Um, she uh, released a paper that was, that, that questioned the results and said, you know, this actually doesn't work. Uh, very well. And, and what was fun here was that FFS is around, FFS is pretty mature, and so there's this horse race now between FFS and LFS. Clearly, one of the things that the LFS authors wanted to show is that, hey, this works a lot better than this old crufty file system design that doesn't do this clever thing that we invented, right? Um, okay, so we say, you know, now FFS, you know, there were a couple of small improvements to FFS that we had to make, and now it performs LFS. Um, you know, uh, John Oosterhout, uh claim, you know, comes back and says, no, this is, you know, uh, poor, poor analysis. I like that. That's like, that's like calling a computer scientist stupid, right? Like that's, you wouldn't say that they were stupid, you would just say that they had performed poor analysis. Um, uh, poor benchmark choice, too. That's like saying that you're, you're ugly or something, like you don't dress very well, right? Poor benchmark choice. Um, so, so, and now in 95, there's another paper. Um, and, and here now we start to get a little bit more nuanced. So I think people are sort of at this point finding out that what the benchmarks are showing is that it depends a lot on the benchmarks you choose and how the disk is actually used. Um, so, you know, and, and, and part of this too, this, is, this seems very quaint at the time, but back then file systems were slow enough that you actually tuned them. So depending on your workload, you would actually tune the file system to, to uh, achieve a certain amount of performance. I suspect that this is still done today in certain very, very, very specialized settings. Um, and it's certainly done on systems like databases that can have big performance bottlenecks. Um, uh, Oosterhout describes that paper as misleading, right? Um, so again, so this, this goes on and on, right? Um, but this is kind of a, this is one of those things that's kind of a, an, an interesting idea. It's a fun retake on the traditional file system design. Question? Would LFS then run, have better performance on like larger disks or whatever the file is stored on them? Well, okay, well, let's think about larger disks, right? 
So what, what would be good about a larger disk for LFS? Yeah. If the planner itself is large, that means that when you're appending to the file, you can assume that most of the time you're not going to have to seek to the middle of a new planner. Yeah. Interesting. Let me come back to that thought. I mean, what about, what's, what's different about large disks as far as seek times are concerned? When I worked at Microsoft a decade ago, they had a, ter they had a term for these big disks that were coming out uh, in all of these PCs. Big, slow disks. So these drives had great capacity, terrible seek times. Um, particularly these sort of consumer grade drives. So seek times, remember, as, as disks get bigger and bigger to some degree, and buses are getting faster and faster, and the density. So when I can find a spot on disk, now I've got this really, really dense medium, um, and I'm picking up a lot of data, and I've got a super fast bus going back to the processor. This is awesome. Um, I don't know, but I, I don't know why this just occurred to me. Did, did any of you guys uh, build machines with those old, terrible IDE ribbon cables? Okay. That's one of the things, when you guys get down on your knees at night and thank God for stuff, like you should thank him for those stupid cables, right? Those things were terrible, right? The SATA ones are so much nicer. Thank you. So much easier to build things. Um, so the, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, okay, so seek times are going to, uh, are uh, seek times on these big drives, but what's gonna get worse probably? So what was this, if the assumption, so seek times, because seek times are, are both sort of, if I can, if the assumptions that LFS tries to make hold, seek times are going to, are, are, you know, are going to help me when I'm writing, but what about reads? On big disks. So if I miss the cache, what happens on a bigger and bigger and bigger disk? Yeah, I have to go a lot farther to get that block. Um, so you, so you can kind of, I mean, you can kind of try to convince yourself what happened here, right? I mean, ext4, I haven't actually done a big survey of modern file system designs, but um, in a log structured file system, I, I don't know, I'm going to get in trouble with John Oosterhout if I say this, but um, I, you know, it never really, you know, caught on. There is one interesting. Um, interesting application of log structured file systems on flash devices that I will leave you to think about, um, particularly given some of the characteristics of flash devices that we talked about before, particularly given the fact that flash devices have this wear leveling problem. So you can think about if I'm really concerned about making sure that I read, particularly, sorry, if I'm really concerned about making sure that I write to every part of the disk sort of equally often, how would a log structured file system design help ensure that? Um, and so that's kind of an interesting question. All right, any other questions on LFS? It's a fun, fun design. It seems like um, it was designed with this assumption that there was going to be consistent or average uh, layouts and sizes. And like what I was trying to bring up earlier is like if you had a very small platter diameter, um, no matter how many platters you had. Yeah. No, okay, so, so sorry, remember, the, the log, you, you can think of the log like from a layout perspective. The, the log really requires minimal seeks, right? So the log starts at one side of the disk and just goes to the other. And I can write to every platter, right? I can write to all the spots on one, all the platters and then I move. So essentially, if you were watching LFS append to a log, you would just see the heads like slowly, slowly, slowly creeping across the disk, right? So it really is the minimal amount of head movement required to write data to the disk. That's the goal. Right. Yeah. And that doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with disk layout. Right? Well, what I was saying is like when they finally get to the center and still have to append, then that, if the disk size is smaller in diameter, it needs to go back to the beginning of the... Well, remember, at that point, I've got cleaning to do and all sorts of other things, right? So yeah, that, at that point, I filled... But you think about, you know, I've got a disk with a couple gigabytes. I've written quite a bit by that point. Right. So yeah, then you get into cleaning and other problems, but to some degree, you know, the, 
So that's a great point. Jumping back to the start of a new log is not something that happens very often, right? Most of the time, and you're right, there are little seeks that I have to do periodically when one segment gets cleaned and the log starts here or whatever. But overall, the idea is when I'm inside a segment, I'm just doing, assuming I'm just doing writes. I'm just doing the minimal amount of seeking as possible. Right? So that's, that's good to some degree. All right, any other questions about L, F, S? Yeah. So again, I mean, just to sort of try to picture in your mind how different the on-disk data structures are between something like LFS and something like EXT4. It's a, it's a fun exercise. Um, yeah, Zach. Is it, for the people who are, I guess, neat freaks, did they ever try to do all the cleaning of the system as audio? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the, um, you know, that's, that's, that's one of these, like, magic tricks that LFS can try to, clean, to, to convince you it can do. It's like, oh, you'll never notice the cleaning, you know? We'll do it when you're not watching. Right. It's like job and garbage collection. It, it, the cleaning is a lot like garbage collection, actually. There's a lot of similarities between it uh, and garbage collection. And you know, it has a lot of the same features as garbage collection. So I don't know, you guys may have, if you've taken classes with Luke or talked to him about stuff, I mean, one of the concerns that certain people have about the job, garbage collector in languages like Java and Go and other things is that the garbage collector can kind of run pretty much whenever. So when you run out of memory, and the garbage collector suddenly has to do this whole sweep of the, uh, the pool to find things that are dead and reclaim them. Um, hopefully you're not a robot that needs to like stop and go along the cliff when the garbage collector runs, because if not, you're, you have a problem, right? So the unpredictability caused by garbage collection is an issue, right? Here's just performance problem. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of similarities between garbage collection and, and log cleaning. Except for the fact that the thing that's awesome about garbage collection is you don't have to call malloc and free. Thank you. Right. I mean, there's, no, there's no equivalent in disks. It's totally worth it. I'm sorry. That debate is over. Um, <laughs> dynamic memory allocation for the win. Automatic. Um, any other questions about LFS? Okay. So let's talk briefly now. I think we have time before we wrap up today to just talk about reading research papers. So are we going to assign maybe half a dozen research papers throughout the rest of the year? Um, these are research papers that I like. I think are, are fun, they're interesting, they have really exciting ideas inside of them um, that are, that, and, and things that follow themes that we've talked about in the class. Um, and we'll talk about them in class, we're gonna go through them together. I would appreciate if you would look at them, um, <laughs> like print them off and just look at it and then put it in the, put it in the bin, right? Um, or maybe actually read parts of it, like the abstract, which is, I don't know, 150 words, maybe the introduction. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how I do this, right? So um, I, I know that may, maybe all of you don't want to be professors when you grow up. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so why would you read research papers? Uh, does anyone read these things? Does anyone care? Um, the, the thing that you'll find out, which is really cool, is that there's still some really exciting and novel ideas out there about how to build computer systems. Um, you know, computer systems is a pretty mature area of computer science, but I still read papers at workshops and conferences, and I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Uh, I hope that that actually happens, right? I hope somebody builds things this way, or this is a really radical take on how to do something that's really neat, uh, really exciting. And, and there are things about computer systems that we're still not quite able to do um, that we probably will be able to do soon as the result of, of some of the research that's going on. Um, one, one interesting example of this, and maybe we should read this paper this year. Um, do you guys hear about, hear the big news about Windows? How many people heard the big exciting news about Windows? It's gonna run Bash, right? Thank you, you know, again, something else I will be adding to my prayer list. Um, and, and a bunch of other stuff. So that capability, it turns out, actually, as far as I understand, I'll have to look at it more carefully, emerged from a research project that people at MSR did, uh, did several years ago where they looked at how to map um, API calls made by Linux-like executables down onto the Windows system call API, right? So there you go. Somebody did research, and now you can run apt-get on uh, Windows 10. You know, that's, that's cool. Or bash, I mean, who cares about apt-get, right? Just having a shell that doesn't stink on Windows is gonna be the best thing to happen to Windows in 50 years. Um, all right, so, um, and, and also when you, when you think about reading papers, the, the normal process that we're gonna go through is to think about what are the design principles here? Um, what's the big idea? And we're gonna try to read papers that have big ideas in them. Um, 
With RAID, you're talking about an idea that was big, measured in like billions of dollars of economic activity caused by this particular idea. Um, not every idea that we'll read about is that big. Um, but, we'll, but these are ideas that you can apply in other places when you're building other kinds of systems, uh, when you're solving other kinds of problems. Um, the, the other reason is that if you're interested in how certain things work, and you don't work at one of these companies, this is frequently the best way to find out how this, so you might wonder, like, how does Google store data? How does Facebook do certain things, right? Um, these companies publish research papers, and, and Apple is the one weird exception. Apple doesn't seem to participate in the research community in any way, but um, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Google, these companies have people that are doing research. They publish papers about what they're going to do, or what they ha usually what they have done, some production system that's five years old. Um, and, and these can be interesting, right? So, um, and these are, again, a fun way to see how these companies are solving problems at scale that, that we don't even, you, you don't even really, uh, like we can't, it's, it's hard for us to imagine. I think I looked it up recently. I think Google now has like a million computers located in their data centers around the world. So like imagine trying to maintain that, <laughs> that network um, and use it for all the things they do. Um, and in a lot of cases, like it's faster than like reading code artifacts and, and more illuminating. Um, the research papers will tell you what's interesting about the system. You can go, in certain cases, if the code is open source, you can go read it. But in a lot of cases, if you're interested in just the design principles that are at play, uh, the paper is a better way to do that. Okay. Um, I don't know why this slide is in here. I saw it today and I was confused. Um, but, you know, the, the other thing to, to keep in mind is that, um, you know, the advance of technology is not just about creating new widgets, right? Creating new, uh, you know, like new toys, right? Creating new features. Um, there are fundamental changes that are going on in the world of technology that are really going to continue to reshape how things work. I mean, we've just lived through decades of probably some of the most radical changes in any technology ever. Um, if you, like, think about the internet. I mean, would people, if there are still people left on Earth a thousand years from now, like, the internet is what they're going to care about from now, right? Like, this is, like, you guys study history, it's like the Bronze Age. It's like thousands of years where they figured out how to use a particular metal, right? This is the internet era. Right? No one is going to care about any of this other stuff. They're going to be like, oh, wow, those people built a lot of incredibly powerful machines and connected them all together. Um, again, this will be in the, in the textbooks in 500 years. Uh, everything else that we talk about today won't. Um, so, wh so what's going on right now? Well, in terms of technology trends that are interesting for you guys to understand, I'm sure you've heard something about the end of Moore's Law scaling. So this exponential roller coaster ride that we've been on is ending. Squeezing more computation out of existing systems is requiring new strategies. And you guys are seeing some of the effect of that. The fact that your smartphone now has four cores in it, or eight cores, is a result of this. Um, or sometimes like four little cores and four big cores. Um, integration of flash, this is maybe a little bit more boring, but it's sort of going on. You know, computing at these massive scales using large numbers of machines, hundreds of thousands or millions of machines. Um, battery powered ubiquitous devices, tiny little things that can run on a coin cell battery for, for years, tiny little computers that are small that you, so small you can't see them. Um, a lot of people interacting with a lot of different devices. Uh, more people interacting with computers in general. How, how many people, what percentage of the earth is on the internet? Does anyone know? Right now. Anyone want to guess? 100%? I like that. It's very optimistic. No way. Okay. 30? Too low. About, about half, I think. About 40, 50%. Right? There are half the people on the Earth that aren't even connected to the Internet yet. When those people connect, it's going to be really interesting. Right? Um, you know, like high-speed networks everywhere. We have a lot of problems right now that are created by either lack of connectivity or crappy connectivity. And these are problems that are going to go away. Even on an airplane, I promise you. Like 50 years from now, you will have a fast network everywhere. It'll be cheap. You won't notice when you move from place to place, even on a plane. We're going to get there, I promise. Uh, even like underwater in weird mines and tunnels. Not What's that? Not in Davis. Not in Davis, sorry. <laughs> or not in these lecture halls, you know? Like people tell me, oh, I've got to use clickers because students can't get online in my class. I'm like, please kill me now. 
Um, all right, so we'll come back to this on Friday. I'll give you a little tips. I'm going to post the information about RAID on Discourse. Please look at it, and we'll talk more about how to read a paper and about RAID on Friday. See you then.